Um, we're going to be taking a closer look at internet browsers. We're going to look at the uh, four major internet browsers that are out tonight. Um, another night, we'll probably continue with some of the lesser known browsers that are out there. Um, so tonight, we're actually dedicating this to... Um, uh, first of all, what we're going to do is um, with the internet browsers, we're actually going to be studying. We're going to be having a look at them, having a look at what um, features they have, some of what they do as far as security, um, expansion, things like, you know, if they get, you can get add-ons or extensions for them, whatever, um, how they synchronize, uh, bookmarks and stuff, things like that. So, so it should be an adventure. <laughs> and uh, we'll go ahead, you know what, let me actually stop this. <laughs> there we go okay cool so we will go ahead and get started here in just a second but <clears throat> first i'd like to remind first i'd like to go ahead and put this out there as always um we're still looking for we're still doing uh fundraising to uh get our startup costs going so that we can incorporate and make ourselves official as a 501c3 nonprofit organization we will be doing things like uh, information technology, tutoring, teaching, um, <clears throat> group study, as well as a number of other things. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I apologize for that. Um, so if that's something that you think you can, if that's something that uh, uh, you think you might be able to um, get behind enough to uh, kind of help us with that goal, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, go to tizen.org and find out a bit more about our mission statement, everything that we plan on doing as a nonprofit organization and how we intend to serve uh, the community here. And you can go to donate.tizen.org to make a donation if you wish, um, as well as find out other ways you can help support the organization. Um, things like purchasing merchandise, things like uh, subscribing to the channel, um, straight donations, things like that um, give if you can give what you can any support however is greatly appreciated um, let's get started here now the browsers that we're going to go over tonight um, one of them only one of them is going to be um, operating system exclusive um, surprisingly enough uh, we're going to be taking a, a, a little bit of a look at Apple Safari which is actually it's exclusive to Mac OS and um, we're going to look at some of its features and security and such. We're then going to have a look at my, uh, Mozilla Firefox. Uh, Mozilla has been around for goodness forever. It's probably the oldest among browsers. It's the uh, veteran, as you will, the, <laughs> the old hat of the game. Um, we're going to move on to Google Chrome, which has been around for quite some time and has gained a lot of traction. A lot of people tend to use that browser, um, so much so that they created their own web kit upon which many other browsers are created. And speaking of, we will also be taking a look at the brand new Microsoft Edge. Um, it used to be exclusive to Windows. Microsoft has, has since changed its um, architecture. So it's now built off of uh, the Chromium WebKit, which is the same WebKit that's based off of Google Chrome, as well as a number of other minor browsers out there that you may have heard of, Opera, Brave, um, Vivaldi, whichever. So let's go ahead and take a look at, let's go ahead and take a look at Safari first. Now, let me get over to the appropriate window here. It's, uh, here we go. Okay. As they go ahead and display this now, Safari is one of the browsers that I do use regularly. So um, you're going to see a little more content on that than you would on any other browser that I have open right now. So let's go ahead and bring that up. There's the browser window. Okay, cool. So Safari. Safari is actually um, 
Apple's done a really good job at making Safari more and more robust with each browser update as well as each uh, OS update. This comes bundled with Mac OS, so there's no extra download or anything that you would need to do provided you're using a Mac. This browser is not available for Windows or Linux or any other operating system. They used to, a long time ago, make it available for Windows up until Safari 6. Safari 5, Safari 6, when Apple decided to drop support for Windows. Um, that would have been back in like the Windows XP days. <laughs> so a very long time ago. But as you can see, this is the browser here. Uh, some of the toolbar items are actually uh, customized on here for what I like to do. But as you can tell, as you can see, and I'm going to see if uh, this shows up on the screen. It doesn't quite show up on the screen does it let me try let me get another yeah that's beautiful it's exactly what we're gonna call that uh, let's see Hmm. Yeah, that's the dialogue that came up. So as you can see, while we could put different buttons, we simply, you know, just like drag and drop what we want into the toolbar up at the top but there's a default set and sometimes uh, add-ons extensions that you put in the browser will um, put themselves in the default set but if you take out things like you know duck duck do go and grab only honey um, and remember you'd be left with the others so it's an easily customizable browser it we can go to the uh, preferences here we can kind of shop around here okay why don't I move that window a little bit so that So that we're not blocking the way here. Excellent. Okay. So of course, all your major, um, all your basic browser options. Most browsers have a lot of these options. Options like you know when the browser opens, what do you want it to show? You know, do you want it to start? You know, have a start page of some sort? Do you want it to open? Um, whatever. You know, whatever you had open your last session. Um, how new windows and tabs open do you want it to show favorites uh, in this case top sites sometimes an empty page sometimes a home page which is always which you can always set again something any major browser does something that makes it one of the features that uh, a lot of uh, modern browsers have just recently implemented that has been safari for quite some time is time deletion of your history and they make it really accessible here um, other browsers have started doing this though recently so you can have it so right now Safari is um, set after one year to uh, to erase any of your browsing history uh, well, we could set that to anything we can set it to a month a day a week two two weeks a month or a year or you can just have it, or if you set it to do it manually, then it's going to be up to you to go ahead and delete your own internet history if that's something uh, that you want to do. Download location generally defaults to downloads, like most browsers. Um, you can point that to somewhere else. Um, favorites, if you go to favorites, if you click, there's a sort of a favorites button 
and if you click that like in a new browser in a new tab it'll show whatever folder you have marked for your favorites so and then there's that and then of course how tabs open you can be specific a little bit with how tabs open um, autofill information a lot of browsers have been doing this for quite some time you fill out you put an ad you know information here on like you know uh, say contact information addresses um, phone numbers you know so if you get a form say you're ordering something from a website you're asked for an address this can auto and autofill feature for that um, Usernames and passwords. Uh, this is something that's actually unique to Safari. Uh, most browsers do have their own, have started their own password storage system. Um, what makes Safari unique is that Safari's usernames and passwords, as well as credit card information, are not only encrypted, but tied into a feature on macOS known as the keychain. And the keychain is basically an encrypted database on Mac OS where all the passwords are stored as well as security related information like certificates and things of the like and um, and so that and that also does get synchronized we'll talk about how, um, Safari synchronizes a lot of this stuff here in just a little bit um, they do give passwords its own place and yeah you, you're gonna be asked for your uh, system password when you go to access it Adjusting the search engine, again, uh, any other browser does this. Um, Highland Raptor Gaming, how's it going? Welcome. I hope you're doing well tonight. Um, good observation, that is however Japanese. Been better? Hmm. I'm sorry to hear that. I hope things do get better for you. So this is something that um, now this is something that Safari was a little late to the party on, but they did eventually um, implement this after like Mozilla and uh, Google implemented on theirs uh, fraudulent site protection. So if it looks strange, it pops up that warning saying, "Hey." something's up here Are you sure you want to go to this website you know here's the problem what have you it does have privacy features also um, they're not as concise you know they're not as um, concise as other browsers but the basics are there you can tell them not to track you you can allow websites to um, use Apple Pay and Apple Card and that is a very specific feature to Safari you go to a merchant website that accepts Apple Pay. And what this does is you'll go to the site, you'll go to pay, you tell it you want to you know, pay with Apple Pay on your computer, and it'll talk with one of your mobile devices, like an iPhone. And it'll ask you to verify and put in the passcode and everything, and it talks back to the system and says, okay, this is approved, go ahead and do the transaction. It's actually kind of neat. It's one of those um, cross-device uh, things that Apple does that's actually quite impressive and then there's the myriad of permissions oh my gosh so Safari has gotten more and more concise with their uh, site permissions now um, they actually made this more coincide with Mac OS's um, various permissions that you can set for different aspects of their OS. So like here for reader, if you want a website to appear in a reader format, which uh, we'll have a look at in just a little bit, but basically reader format basically takes out a lot of the extras that's on the website, a lot of the graphics, a lot of the advertising, a lot of the, a lot of the distracting stuff that's in the margins and basically just gives you the text as you would see it in say you know a blog or something it's pretty nice it's very helpful content blocking basically it'll help block some of the ads and stuff that come up 
autoplay. Now this is nice and some browsers are starting to do this now, but in so far you can actually tell it not to play videos automatically on websites. This is something that's actually very nice because like, let's say you're going to a news website like CNN or something. You know how sometimes they got like a video that pops up in the corner or something and it just starts playing, just arbitrarily starts playing. You know, suddenly you start hearing the video, it's just playing in the corner there, doing its own thing. Um, this will actually stop any website from doing that. It's pretty nice. You can set defaults for page zooms, which is pretty neat. Now, it's something to keep in mind is that this only shows websites that you've visited on your browser, okay? So, if you go to a new website, you'll probably be asked if that website tries to access any of this stuff, it'll pop up and let you know, hey, this website's trying to use your camera. Do you want to give it permission to do that? And you could tell it to block or allow or whatever it is that, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, same with the microphone. And same with screen sharing. Uh, there are sites like, you know, support-based websites like LogMeIn that will do screen sharing. Obviously location, even specific permission on downloads. And this is actually fairly interesting because if you're on a website and suddenly it wants to try and download something to your computer, this will actually catch it and you'll get a pop-up saying, hey, this domain is trying to download something. Do you want it to do that? And you can either allow it or block it, stop it in its tracks. Notifications, a fairly new feature in just about any browser, but I saw it on Safari first. And just because I saw it on Safari first doesn't mean they were the first to do it. But basically, this allows your browser to use the notification system in case something new happens in one of your tabs. Perfect example is Gmail. So you have Gmail in one of your tabs, you get a new mail, it'll actually use the notification system in, in Mac OS to pop up a notification saying, hey, you got new mail, you know. <clears throat> uh, browsers that are on Windows will similarly do that with Windows 10 and its notification system. And of course, pop-up windows. This is something that's been around for a long time. It has the ability to block pop-ups. And you can either tell it to notify you as it blocks it or just outright block it or allow. And then there's also some advanced features with the browser also. Um, things like if you wanted to show the full website instead of just like part of it in the search field, um, which it does by default, there's accessibility options to set like a minimum font size if you're having trouble seeing, tab highlighting, you can tell it to save articles for offline reading, which is a very nice feature. Um, if you're on a laptop, if you're on a desktop and you're constantly connecting the internet, you might not ever use that. Um, something that's really unique is plugins. And again, this is something more specific to like laptop usage. But you know, if you're on battery power and you're running low on battery power, Safari will know to stop plugins from working so that some of that battery power is conserved. Um, style sheet information. So you may or may not know this, but websites use style sheets to help unif to help um, have a unifying format on their website. Specific fonts, specific colors, specific font sizes based on titles, headings, regular text, images, things like that, right? You can actually set your browser to do this. That will actually override some of those website defaults. So if you put a like a style sheet, that's what it's called, a style sheet. It's CSS extension. If you put that in your browser, then that covers all the defaults in case they're either not specified on the site or you want some of those defaults for these other websites to be overridden. Um, and a lot of a, a lot of browsers do something similar to this. All right. Proxy settings. 
there is a proxy settings. Um, proxy settings are generally set on Mac OS. They're generally set in the system preferences. So they're not specific to the browser. Uh, so, you know, in Safari, if you're going to be setting proxies to use the internet, you're setting them system wide. It's kind of a downside, but it also simplifies things also. And then the show develop menu. So if you know on Mac OS, there's menu items along the top of the screen. They're not, they don't stick to the window like they do in Windows or in uh, Linux, depending on what you're using for your uh, UI. But the develop menu helps give access to things like changing the user, like changing the browser agent. Basically, that means telling a website that you're using a browser that's different from what you're actually using. So you could basically say, okay, I want to tell websites that I'm using Firefox. So you go to the development menu, you go to user agent, you select Firefox. And that's supposed to trick web pages into displaying the website as if you were using the browser you're telling it rather than the browser you actually are. And um, that is something that can be done in any browser. Um, and there's also other options, be it earlier versions of Safari, um, Edge, they took out Internet Explorer, but Edge, um, different versions of Chrome. This is also where you can set things up like um, WebRTC, which is basically um, camera and multimedia access for things like um, for things like conferencing, like teleconferencing and, and such. So you have a little bit more control over how the browser can use, say, your camera and your microphone. Excuse me there. All right. But that's basically what we're looking at as far as options in Safari. And the way it actually displays web pages is pretty standard. If we were to go to Google, like there's going to be no surprise that it's going to show up, you know, with Google. There we go. See, it came up. Now it is compatible with uh, HTML5, so it'll handle just about anything that a modern that you know modern web pages will throw at it. Um, it will do support for style sheets, so anything default on the web browser will come through just fine. Um, it'll do multimedia pretty well. One thing that it doesn't come with, and I'm not sure if any of the browsers come with this automatically. I don't think so anymore. Um, is Flash. Flash has to be installed separately on any browser. So if you're looking for something, if you're looking for a browser that has Flash um, already installed, you might be out of luck there. <laughs> um, but we'll go to a couple websites here. This is ours. Now things might be a tad slower than normal because we're trying to do all this on one computer while streaming and all this other fun stuff. But yeah, there that comes. It's, and I mean, this website is, um, it's built on WordPress. It's built on, you know, is it true that some websites are moving away from Flash? Um, I know some of them are, others uh, not so much. Why I couldn't say. I'd have to do a little more research on that. Um, I suspect some of it probably has to do with security. Um, the one thing that's notorious with Flash is that it's so popularly used that it gets targeted a lot. So, um, 
So I know, yeah, there are some websites that are trying to shy away from that and just use something that's built in for the browser. You know, HTML5 allows basic video play just with the code itself. All you have to do is tell it which video file you want it to play and it'll play it natively. So, you know, that being said, you know, unless there's something special that you're trying to do with the video, Flash really isn't necessary anymore. <clears throat> of course, multiple tabs, complete with the little icon there and stuff. Obviously, you can check out places like Twitter. Twitter works just fine, as you'll see in just a second. And uh, by the way, oh, and as you can see here, okay, it's automatic um, password features coming up. And this is something that's unique with Safari is that with, with Safari, it will try its dangest to use its own built-in password system first, okay? Sometimes it takes a little coaxing to get other password systems to work, like right here. I tend to prefer to use um, Remember, which is um, which is one of many password storage and syncs out there. It's actually very nice, very simple, and I would absolutely recommend it. But we're not talking about those tonight. We'll get into those later on. Well, we'll go ahead and tell it to use its built-in one because it's quicker. Oh, yeah, there's um authentication code. Give me a second. L. Sorry, I'm going to take this off the screen for just a second. while I put that in. Never show your password and authenticator information to anybody else, ever. Ever. That's like giving a stranger the key to your house. Don't do it. So yeah, all that comes up comes up just fine. This is actually the Twitter feed for for us for uh Tizen. And let's see if this works. Let's see if we can Actually, there isn't a reader mode on this, is there? Okay. Let's try something else. Let's go to Let's go to Reuters. And it's actually pretty good no matter which um search engine you have. It's pretty good at trying to resolve the uh domain, the website first before uh bringing up search results. Okay, so there's Reuters. Come on. So as you can see, it displays. It does a pretty good job at loading pages, displaying just fine. And so here's the reader view. So if we show reader view, which um, if you want a shortcut key, it's shift command R. This is what its reader view looks like.
This is really nice because it takes out all the clutter. It takes out all the garbage. It takes out all the everything. Just gives you the text and gives it to you in a readable, in a more easily readable way. If we were to, the downside is it has to reload the page every time you do it. Let's hit a, um, let's try and find a website that, um, well, there's no avoiding the, <laughs> there's no avoiding COVID-19 in any website. So we're just going to pick one of these. All right. And you can see it. You see, you've got the typical webpage with your menu up here, social media links, pictures, some trending over here. Some of the advertising is blocked because of Safari. Safari is set to block ads. And there's also another extension I have that also helps with that. So, so there's the text. And it's pretty readable as it is here. But if you need something a little easier to read, there's that. So this is the reader view. And it'll still show you like infographics and stuff like that. But as you can see, it basically just condenses it, shows you just the text, takes out all the other distractions. It's really nice. That's probably one of the features I like best about um, Safari is the way it does that. Now we're gonna, Now I wanted to talk a little bit about security. So... When it comes to security, a lot of browsers do a lot of the same things. You know, for example, and let me see if I can't bring the uh, preferences window back up again. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So, for example, some of the security features. Now, this looks very simplistic, and it kind of is. All right. And most of the time, if you're going to be really serious about security in your browser, you're going to be installing add-ons or extensions, whatever it is, however it phrases that. But here, just for like the basic security options, the fraudulent website um, warning that comes up, you've probably seen this before. Anytime you get to a website that's, you know, let's say there's something wrong with the certificate and normally it'll pop up saying, hey, there's this problem with this website you want to go back to safety or do you click advanced and tell it to go to the website anyway and um, something I generally don't suggest doing unless you really really know that website is to try and go anyway um, sometimes that needs to be done like let's say you're at work there's like an internal website that you need to access. Sometimes you might need to do that, but otherwise, unless you absolutely know the website that and trust it, absolutely never ever tell it to go to the website anyway. Just go back to safety and forget about it. Um, privacy, I like to consider privacy also a part of security because they kind of go hand in hand sometimes. Um, cross tracking. You can tell it to block all cookies. There are advantages and disadvantages to this. Um, but cookies are just, they're, they're basically bits of website data that are locally stored for the browser to pick up later on. So for things like if you've already logged into a website, uh, it's token information maybe stored in a cookie. Um, any preferences that you may have put on a website specifically, that kind of stuff gets stored in a cookie. <clears throat> And then obviously another way to manage uh, security is through uh, what uh, Safari calls extensions. And these are add-ons. These are like if you had Chrome and you went to the Chrome store and, you know, got add-ons for it. Um, for that or Firefox or whatever. Really the only security related thing I got on here is this guy here. This is what I was talking about. Um, and like any other browser, Safari has its own store. 
Um, it's actually, all the extensions are actually tied into the uh, App Store on the Mac, so everything's in one place on Mac OS if you happen to have that. <clears throat> synchronization. So as far as synchronization goes, everything that you synchronize on Apple is tied to iCloud. So that means your bookmarks are tied to iCloud. Um, if you tell it to sync bookmarks, you can tell it to sync favorites, you can tell it, and all that stuff is actually done within iCloud's preferences and not, um, not Safari itself. So if you ever, and this is, and the same is true for um, iOS devices like the iPhone and the iPad. It's all talks together. So it'll synchronize your bookmarks if you tell it to. Um, it'll synchronize passwords, which they reference as synchronizing the keychain. Because remember, everything security wise from your passwords to your certificates is done on keychain. All right. So. All that's done through um, iCloud. Um, Keychain, to my understanding, is read end to end, which means the database is encrypted, and Apple, not even Apple, can see the contents of your keychain, um, since the encryption reading is done on the device itself. So. So yeah, that's all tied to the iCloud. So if you're using an Apple device and you tell iCloud to sync, then you're gonna get everything, then you're gonna get everything synchronized. Um, but it also does a few additional things, um, things that other browsers are starting catching up on using their own systems. Um, things like tabs, things like websites, websites you've visited, um, other tabs that you may have had on another device, um, excuse me, so say you were looking at Google on your phone, on your iPhone, but you don't have it up here. You could tell it, I mean, there's, um, there's even like a cloud tabs menu that comes up so that you can see which websites were on different devices. It's pretty handy, pretty easily accessible and, and pretty well within reach. So, um, so all in all, a very secure browser. Um, sometimes it's not as compatible with certain things as, um, as say Chrome or Edge or Firefox. Um, there have been times where I've had a little bit of trouble in Safari with like Twitch. Not much, um, mostly to do with um, using the uh, content creator side of things. Um, sometimes things don't load quite like they should so still a few shortcomings but overall safari is pretty robust so i want to move on to mozilla firefox now firefox and chrome i haven't looked at in um a couple of versions so there might be a little bit of discovery here <laughs> on both our parts but that's quite all right so Let me locate my um, Firefox window. Here it is. Okay. This is a fresh install, so you're not going to see a whole lot <laughs> as far as bookmarks or content, you know, anything like that. But this is Firefox. This is what a new Firefox install looks like. I imagine it looks similarly to Windows since this is a cross platform browser um, actually one of the more accessible cross-platform browsers out there because you can get Firefox for Mac OS for Windows for several different distributions of Linux so very much so a cross-platform browser um, all your basics are right there um, very bare basic as a matter of fact it's prompting us to set up. It automatically opens this tab upon first run. 
Firefox is big on privacy, so. And what's really cool is their disclosure. They go into just about how they use your data for everything, if any of it gets shared. So, and it's mostly standard stuff. All right, but it's good that they're specific and open about it. But that is more of a company practice thing. Preferences don't pop up in a separate window like they do in Safari. They come up in a browser tab, just like it's been done in any Chromium-based browser. And here, is we, and here we, we see, you know, a lot of different options, more so than in Safari. Safari tends to simplify things a little bit for people. This, however, gives you multiple options. Um, here's where you make the default browser Firefox if you want to. Um, here's how tabs work, how you how that would control tabs. Language and appearance. So here's basically where you could set if nothing's set for that web page, these are the settings that we'll use for your fonts and your font size and such. Here's your default zoom option. Uh, I'm not sure if it does a default zoom per website like Safari does, but this is overall. And you can actually tell it here whether or not to only zoom in the text, leaving the images alone. So that's fine. There's multilingual support in this browser. So if you want your menus and such to come up in Spanish, you can have it do that. You can't do that in Safari unless you change the language of the operating system. So that's kind of cool. More files download, pretty standard. Um, This tells you, that, I mean, this kind of controls which, you know, what can, opens in which applications. So, like, if you click on an email address in a web browser, it'll pop up with whatever you have for default for a mail client. Whether it's, like, you know, mail for Mac OS or if you're using Thunderbird Outlook, it'll list that here. Or you could tell it to open something different. That's fine. PDFs. Most browsers come with a built-in capability to read PDFs. However, if you want to change that to something else, whether it's like the default application in Mac OS, which is Preview, um, or if you want to use another application, let's say you have Adobe Reader and you wanted to use that, you could tell it to use that. A lot of times, however, it's quicker to allow the browser to open a PDF file within the browser because then it doesn't have to try and pull open another application to do it. It just pops up in that tab or in a new tab. So typically it's quicker to let the browser handle it and then tell it to save if you want to view it in something else. But that said, you know, there are uses to not having the browser do that, especially if it's a form you need to fill out. Um, a lot of times viewing a, um, a PDF file in a browser doesn't allow you to access form fields, so you can type in your own input on those. Um, a lot of times you can only do that through an application that's um, designed to do that with PDFs, like Adobe Reader or Preview or, or what have you. Updates. So updates for Safari are done through Mac OS. So it doesn't have its own separate update section. Any other browser does. Um, I don't know. I don't think Edge has its own updates section in Windows. I might be wrong about that. I'd have to double check. But I know Chrome and Safari do in all OSs. And Edge will in Mac OS. Um, Well, yeah, updates, how it handles updates, whether you want it to install it or not. Browsing features, recommended extensions, 
things like that and uh, network settings which here you have your own this is where like if you have a proxy you need to set up in order to use in order to browse the internet effectively this is where you go to set all that so very robust in features um, home page how and what you want displayed on your home page search bar you know access to bookmarks things like that search now over time we've gotten used to the net, the combined search and navigation bar having the one input that does both but back in the day all right back in like the 90s and early 2000s they were done as separate fields where you had navigation in the one and search in the other and that's if the browser had a separate search field mozilla was the first was it mozilla it was netscape i think netscape was the first browser to come up with its own um search field up in the bar with whatever search engine you want set and back then your options were pretty much you know alta vista yahoo and google google just came out but here are your options nowadays i think you used to be able to set it to lycos also <laughs> but yeah google um Amazon, if you just want your browser to search for stuff. <laughs> Bing, which is Microsoft search engine. DuckDuckGo, which is independent. And probably the most private of search engines out there. And how the search actually functions. And if you don't see a preferred search engine in here, you can tell it to find more search engines. And it'll pop up. There's DuckDuckGo. See, it takes you to its add-ons page. And some add-ons will provide um, functionality for the search bar. So it's got plenty of options. Plenty of expandability for this browser. Security. Now, I'm noticing a number of browsers are starting to do this, where they give um, security standing, uh, security settings categorically. So they basically clump things into like standard, strict, um, custom, easygoing. Um, Internet Explorer used to do some uh, stuff similar to this when it came to things like uh, privacy settings, ActiveX settings. Um, they would have like, you know, low, medium, medium, high, and high. That's similar to this. And it's nice that other browsers are getting on board to help simplify things for people. And I'm sure most people will want to use standard. However, there are reasons why people might need more strict protection to keep trackers off you, to keep, you know, cross-site stuff out of the way um, to help you know blocking out biometrics like using fingerprint re you know fingerprint readers and things like that um, for within the browser and this is stuff I mean this is something that I can see people who use their browser to access se uh, sensitive information a lot people that work in banks for example that have to look up account information through a web application. Um, people in hospitals are using medical um, or, you know, work in medical that have to look up patient information. You know, this is HIPAA stuff. It's very, I uh, haven't, haven't worked IT for medical coding before. HIPAA is such a big deal. And browser security is a big part of that. So, you know, any of you guys that are using um, using it to access medical information might want to set it to strict. And if you want, you can set up custom settings. You could tell it, you know, 
you can tell it to block certain block or unblock certain things. You can tell it, you know, what kind of cookies you want it to block, things like that. Normally for most people, you won't really have to go into that. And again, there are going to be add-ons that cover some of what the browser doesn't. So, so there's always that expandability. Cookie storage management. Here is Firefox's built-in password system. You have the option. You have the option to give it an additional layer of protection by setting a master password before it'll even access any of your other passwords. Which, you know, as long as you can remember that master password, it's something I do recommend using. And this way it kind of helps keep this way there's that extra layer of protection, so it's not just the browser automatically unlocking the encryption. On those passwords you explicitly had to give it a password um, just another layer of protection you know in case there's like a hacking attempt or something and then obviously setting separate permissions just like kind of like what we saw in Safari um, location camera mic what websites can use the notification system which sites can autoplay videos which is nice uh, virtual reality this is where WebRTC comes into play a little bit. You get to block pop-ups. You can set exceptions like which websites, you know, you will allow block pop-ups no matter how this is set. Also for uh, websites trying to install its own add-ons. Typically, I recommend keeping it there as well. Um, preventing accessibility services I'm guessing you know I won't guess we'll just look at it we'll just look it up okay this goes into accessibility service indicator and again the concern here is that something may have like a virus or malware or something And then how it handles certificates. Um, so if you don't understand certificates, certificates are kind of, certificates are something that verifies the security of a website. So when you go to like a website that begins with HTTPS, it checks its security against a certificate. And there's a small list of security companies that actually verify these certificates, uh, verify their um, encrypted connectivity, and things like this so when the browser sees a certificate that's say self-signed where basically whoever created the certificate signs off on it rather than having a, a third party a notable third party sign off on the certificate like for example um, Komodo or uh, let's encrypt or um, McAfee you know Norton, I think, does uh, certificate verification also. Then it's going to pop up with a warning. If the certificate's not signed at all, it's going to come up with a warning and tell you that it's probably not secure. You know, so that's what that is. And then finally, synchronization. So, like with most browsers, outside of... Um, like with most browsers, like with some browsers, this has its own synchronization. Um, this has its own synchronization system. Um, Firefox, along with some of the lesser known browsers, you basically have to open an account with them and then synchronize stuff on their servers. So that if you want to use the same bookmarks you have on here that you do, on like the iOS version of Firefox or the Android version of Firefox or Linux or whatever. That's how you do it. You do it through this. 
and it syncs as much as it can. Um, browsers, history tabs, passwords, all tend to get all tend to get synchronized to all of your devices. Other things, however, like add-ons and preferences, don't always get transferred from device device to device. A lot of times add-ons are compatible with mobile versions of the browser so they don't get synchronized to say your iPhone or your or your Samsung Galaxy or whatever. Um, also some preferences don't match up between desktop and mobile browsers so those might not match up on your mobile device either. But many of these sort of things will. And again it's convenient. Um, I don't know much about uh, security involving that. I imagine that, you know, with the account and everything, the data is encrypted, especially if passwords are involved. But I encourage you to look into that at another time. Um, and maybe we might even do a show, a segment on that. So extensions. So you remember on Safari, we just discussed um, add-ons that you can get for your browser. Well, Firefox is no different from that. Um, now it has its own it's, it has its own set of add-ons. Um, one of the features that's more unique to Firefox as well as Chrome are browser themes. And it gives a few examples here, like install theme, install theme. So what this does is for themes on Firefox, and it's been doing this for years. If you've ever had Firefox before, then you'll know that you can get a theme that helps change the look of your browser. As you can see along the top now, we've got that nice nighttime uh, northern woods uh, along the top browser there. It actually looks really cool. Some of them even change the home page. This one doesn't seem to do that, but some of them will also put a background image on the home page. Which again, kind of nice. Strictly preferential. Those are recommendations. Now, there are other add-ons you can get. You can go specifically to um, extensions. These will appear a lot of times in the um, bar at the top. So if we were to do Privacy Essentials by uh, DuckDuckGo, and now you see that it's up here. And give me a second because for whatever reason, <laughs> for whatever reason, the uh, cursor's pinwheeling on me while it's, oh, that's because it wanted to open something else. Sometimes that's the annoying part about <laughs> add-ons is that they open up more pages, so not necessarily. If, if you just want to move on, it kind of holds things up. Themes, again, this is where you can get more themes for your browser. And these options are expanded more too. Like if you go to find more add-ons at any point, you'll get taken to Mozilla's add-ons page where you could search and directly install add-ons from here. And that includes themes and themes and the like. I'm sorry, I thought that was gonna take us to security related extensions. Guess not. All right. But yeah, you get a number of th things here like LastPass Password Manager, uBlock Origins, which helps block ads. All those can get installed on the browser. You just go to it, you click on it, click Add to Firefox, and there it is. And you'll see it appear there. It'll tell you it's been added. You click on it, it'll give you options, all that fun stuff. And then plugins. 
Now, there is a small difference between extensions and plugins, okay? Sometimes in extensions will include plugins, but plugins basically alter more or add to how the browser can function at its at its core. And this includes things like um, multimedia codecs, as we see here, uh, video codec for uh, Cisco, for WebRTC. So if you happen to be using a Cisco system, that'll be, you know, that'll be good for you. Um, and as you notice, there's only a couple that are listed here. Sometimes um, extensions will install plugins. But it used to be, for the longest time, it used to be that extensions and plugins were one and the same. It was all the same thing. And now there's a distinction. And this is information on how to manage those add-ons. So... So we kind of went over synchronization. We went over um, we went over add-ons, expandability, features. I'm trying to think if there's anything security related that we did not go over, and I think we went over the browser security uh, pretty well. Um, but that's that's a close look at Firefox in more of a nutshell, and something that I do want to do actually. Let's set another window capture here. Now video capture, window capture, window capture. Here we go. Window capture three. There we go. So what you're seeing here What you're seeing here is Activity Monitor. This is a tool on Mac OS that tells us technical information like, you know, how much memory or CPU something is using, um, whether it's a process or an application, uh, how much energy is using, what it's doing with the disk. If it's using network activity, it'll show that as well. And the reason I brought this up is because sometimes these browsers tend to be a little notorious for using a lot of memory. And I noticed that there are times when browsers get updated and such that they go through periods where they tend to be complete memory hogs and there are other times where they're not so memory heavy. Um, right now, Firefox is using a minimal amount of memory, but we don't have too much open right now. Um, obviously, with each tab you open, the more memory it's going to use. Safari, though, we got... Safari is normally good with memory, better than most browsers. Um, it's only using 250 megabytes and... You know, I've got like two other Safari windows open with a ton of um, with a ton of things open. Tornado Alley, how's it going tonight? How's your nephew doing? How is that situation? And I'm going to continue while you type your answer. No, I'm actually on uh, Mac OS. But Safari is not available for Windows. So that's the interesting thing about Safari is that it tends to be a lot better on memory, which, being that it's designed specifically for Mac OS, is no real surprise to me. Uh, whereas Firefox is using up more memory, and we hardly have anything open. So... <laughs> Uh, 
But again, that's expected. So, so then that's Safari itself. Yeah, Safari used to be available for Windows. It's not anymore. In fact, this hasn't been available in Windows for a long, long time. I think Safari 5 or 6 was like the last version, and that was back in Windows XP days. Now, the thing with Safari is, um, like most browsers, it'll show every single tab and what kind of memory it's using. The application itself might not use a whole lot of memory. And like with Firefox, we only have the one tab open outside of, you know, our preferences and such. So we don't have a whole lot going on. But with most other browsers, you'll see different entries here for different tabs. This is actually a little easier to see in Windows Task Manager. Um, so like right here, you see one website that's actually pulled up on Safari and it's taken up some memory right now as is Wowhead, which is normal for Wowhead, <laughs> fortunately. And that's, so that's an examination of Firefox. Again, cross-platform, so if this is something you like, it they pretty much have a version of this for any operating system right now. Um, it's operating system. This means that the latest version of Safari is not available for Windows operating system. Okay, yes, again. It may still be available. Okay, so you can go download it. All right, so if you want to download Safari for Windows, technically you could still install it. It's going to be, I want to say it's a... Yes. So it was a five version, so I was right there. So if you want to install Safari for Windows, you could, but I don't recommend it because Apple stopped developing for it. That means any latest security patches are not going to be on it. You're going to make yourself susceptible to malware <laughs> if you use that version of Safari for Windows. It's an old, old, old version. Don't do it. Uh, I guess they still have it. Do they still make it available? I guess you could still download it if you wanted to. Apple may have it. Apple may still have it on their support pages. And why they would do that, I don't know. It would be terribly not secure. I personally wouldn't keep it up. <laughs> All right. Let's have a look at Chrome. And it doesn't have the latest features. And Apple stopped developing because, because it couldn't be updated. Okay. Well, that's interesting. That's good to know. That's good to know. I haven't I haven't read that support page recently. That's very good to know. Thank you for that tornado. Um, then the house. So they are going to condemn the house. No, that's a shame. That really stinks. <laughs> Do you know um do you know if your um nephew's parents do they plan on just rebuilding on that spot, just like tearing down that just like tearing down that house and getting a new one built, or are they just gonna buy a new one? Or are they just are they gonna rent from now on? Chrome is a resource of memory problem on Windows. Yeah. Memory problems are more common on Chrome than they are on Firefox. The same is actually true for, for uh, Mac OS also. And um, that's something that we're actually going to take a look at here right now. Let me go ahead and switch windows and switch gears. Google Chrome. All right. All right, folks, here is Google 
Chrome. Now, Chrome is not nearly as old as Firefox, and it's not quite as old as Safari either. Um, compared to compared to the other compared to any other major browser out there, it's the oldest out of the young, <laughs> is what I'd like to say. Um, it has been out. That said, it has been out for a number of years. Has been through some improvements on it, you know, all on its own. Okay. But it has gotten so popular that Google's even made its own WebKit and made it available for other uh, software developers to develop on, to build on. So that's why a number of like smaller browsers that are out there use the Chromium WebKit. That's what it's called. Um, so if you're looking at using something like Opera or Vivaldi or Brave or something like that, those browsers are built off Chromium. It's probably the most widely accessible web kit, web kit out there, which would make sense considering so many browsers use it. Um, nephews, parents, brothers, etc. have joint custody, I tell you, and is his mother's house they can't afford to rebuild. Okay. I'm not downloading Netscape and you... <laughs> Are you kidding me? Uh, you know what? I'm not even sure if the latest version of Netscape would even work on Mac OS anymore, considering uh, considering Mac OS, since it no longer uses PowerPC structure um, for their uh, processors. Did it freeze? Right, I'm showing it's still running. Is anyone else having issues viewing my stream right now? is a little choppy yeah um <clears throat> i might have to try in future broadcast to get another system to stream through the capture card because i'm doing this all on one system and despite having despite it despite my system having like 24 gigs of memory it's still on an i5 and it's still a what how old is this system the system that I on it's a uh, 2013 so yeah seven years old <laughs> so yeah I mean is anyone else having quite the problems that tornadoes having where I come up and then just completely freeze up for a moment? Or is it just like a little choppy? Like Jay and Lee is experiencing. You think it's just us? Well, I mean, see, here's the thing, and you know, Tornado's got a point. I have to run certain applications in the background um, in order to make the stream work, okay? That said, I'm also running now three browsers instead of four on this same system in order to do this presentation. I'm also running a background monitor in order to display a browser's performance. So I think in future tech streams, I might need to get another system that will, that I can just stream through the capture card. 
And that should ease up on the system resources. In the meantime, though, I'm going to go ahead and continue. Yeah, tornado, if it, if. Well, screen resolution, that has more to do with bandwidth. Bandwidth is not a problem. I'm uploading at 20 gigabits per second. So that's that's going to be plenty. Let's see. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the specs and when there's browser activity, it tends to dip. So it's definitely related to the browsers, I think. <clears throat> yeah, I think for future tech streams, I'm probably going to use another system and just stream it through the capture card. And we'll see how that works out. Well, I'm not going to stream at 720, sorry. <laughs> It's pretty important to me to do this at 1080. Um, let's see. Okay. So we haven't set up anything on Chrome. That's why Chrome looks like the way it does, okay? But as you can see, the layout's very much the same uh, for this as it is for Firefox. Again, a lot of browsers have are very similar to one another nowadays. A lot of it will boil down to preference. But I guess since it's in front of us, we'll talk about the synchronization part of this now. So synchronization is tied to your Google account, your Gmail account. So, graphically, it's important, especially for gaming. And I'm not going to adjust my stream every single day. That's, that's, that's a lot. It's too much work. So, um, I mean, if I have to broadcast at 720p all the time, then there was no point in me upgrading my internet to do that at all. <laughs> So it's something I'd have to mull over. So synchronization is done through your Google account. Okay. Um, so that's tied to your Gmail. That's including like your passwords, your bookmarks, again, all that fun stuff. Um, Add-ons that you're using. And again, keep in mind, that some things that get synchronized won't synchronize over to all devices. Again, you're not going to be able to use your add-ons on the mobile version of, of uh, Chrome, but the bookmarks you will. Um, but it does it, and it does it with relative, it does it with relative efficiency, and again, because there's passwords involved, there's going to be some encryption, so... Yeah, I may do that. I may end up doing that. The only downside to that is if I get done early and start game streaming, then I got to stop the stream to adjust it back. And uh, I don't like having to stop the stream mid show. <laughs> Let's see, Chrome can help keep your data. Yeah. Now, one thing that we don't see in some of these other browsers is, uh, and this must be something that's relatively new, um,
but the browser has a built-in safety check for things that are mainly built into the browser if there's extensions that are causing some problems it'll pick it up whether or not safe browsing is turned on whether or not the application's up to date um, it'll check on the password database that it has built in so that's kind of nice here's some more stuff for security um, again a little bit of condensed but each of these areas has an expansion out to get you some of the options that we've seen in other browsers before um, things like you know which browsers can access your location your camera um, which can use the no built-in notifications for your OS this has something additional for uh, websites that are running flash you can tell it to opt to just block websites or block the flash plugin altogether something that we were talking about earlier since fewer websites are starting to use flash for animations now So there's more specific options with security here. Everything is just pretty layered. Site settings, security, and again, categorized security settings. Only in here you can pick a category and then if you want, you can actually make certain adjustments depending on what you have set and what other things are set in the browsers. Um, note that if you've got a plugin here that's manipulating some of these settings, it'll tell you. Or you could tell it not to do any protection at all, which is not recommended. And to that, I agree. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, now, interestingly enough, um, Chrome and a lot of other Chromium based browsers have built in, have a way to either manage certificates as built in or at an operating system level. In this case, since we're on a Mac, it's any of these options are going to open up Keychain. I forget on Windows if it opens up something that's Windows, uh, whatever Windows uses to manage certificates. I think it does. Appearance, again, if you like themes, if you want your browser to look a certain way, Chrome offers that. And here's where the other visual settings lie. If you want the home button to display or not, as you can see, we can turn it on and off. It pops up. Some people like the home button, others don't. The only options for the home page right now, which are a little limited in my opinion, um, either a blank page or a web page you don't have the option to like say show some of your favorites like you do in safari or or whatnot you can tell it to show the bookmarks bar if you want all browsers do this and you know again you can customize your font settings and things like that so you know again if there's no style sheet on a web page or something and there's nothing by default specified you can set that stuff here. Now, one thing that started getting common with Chromium based browsers is this setting. And I think there's something similar in uh, Windows where it basically gives a warning when you're trying to exit out of the browser just to make sure you really want to exit out of the browser. <laughs> so, if you want that warning just in case, I mean, this could be handy in case you know there's another application on your system or a piece of malware that's trying to close your browser and it's not something that you initiated this would catch it this would say hey browser is trying to close are you sure you want to do this search engines again you can choose whichever search engine you want to use You can even edit how that search is manipulated. You can add more search engines if you know the string. 
If you're not that advanced though, I wouldn't recommend tinkering with that and just choosing whatever browser you'd like to you like to use. Hi Wolfie, how's it going? Welcome to the stream. I hope you're doing wonderful. The browser has a built-in spell checker, which is great. And knowing Google, it probably does its spell check through its own lexicon that it has somewhere on Google's cloud somewhere. Just like everything else Google does. Awesome. I'm glad to hear it, Wolfie. I'm glad to read it. Here's where you pick where things download. Printing options. So, Chromium-based browsers have their own have their own ways of uh, printing. Um, you can access print options through it. Again, in Mac OS, it's going to open system preferences under printing if you click on printers here. And then there's also Google Cloud Print. And basically what Google Par Cloud Print does is it picks up on the printers that you have locally on your system. And if you're signed into your Google account, it will allow you to access that printer to print from things wherever you're signed into your Google account. So it basically allows you to, like if you're on your cell phone and you see something that you want to print up, as long as you're signed into your Google account and you go to Google Cloud Print, you could tell it to print that web page on your printer at home. It's pretty neat. Obviously, accessibility features, things like captions. System, system performance. Uh, again, proxy settings. Unlike Firefox, but more like Safari, proxy settings, when you click on that, on a Mac, we'll go to system preferences. So basically, proxy settings are going to be system wide instead of just specific to the browser. And there's one place here where you can reset all those settings. Just bring everything back to defaults. Extensions. All right, extensions. This is where your add-ons are going to go. So like any other browser, this does add-ons. And like obviously Google's, Google is going to include their own stuff. If you want more extensions, they're going to be on this Google Web Store, this Chrome Store. Now, again, if you're signed into your Google account, all right, it'll know which it'll know which add-ons you have for your that you have uh, installed on Chrome browsers previously. So, if you have to reinstall your browser, or if you install on another system and sign into Google there, it's going to try and bring whatever add-ons you have installed automatically. Which is nice. It saves you some time having to search through stuff you already have. And again, pretty easy stuff. We're just going to go with Google Translate here because that's simple enough and should be quick enough. All right. And as you can see, it popped up here popped up in the puzzle piece. So by default, it just puts everything in the puzzle piece here. If you tell it to pin it, however, it'll stay up there. So we know it's installed now. If we go back to extensions, there it is. And typically each extension has its own settings. There are going to be some common settings. You can allow it, and just like with any extension, you can allow it to um, 
use an incognito window, which is basically, it's what they call a private browsing window, just like, um, just like in private for Firefox and private for any other browser. Now, a lot of times it's not recommended that you allow extensions to be used in um, private browsing windows. The idea of a private, the idea of a private browsing window, is to give you a separate window where there is absolutely no tracking whatsoever. Your visit to that website is not saved. No cookies saved for anything that you visit in a private browsing window. No extensions or add-ons are used in a private browsing window. Unless you tell those until unless you tell those extensions to be used in a private browsing window. And that's generally not recommended because there are there are uh, plugins out here that can actually track what it is you type, which kind of defeats the purpose of having a private browsing window. <laughs> so if at all possible, try not to do it. This browser has themes also. We can change the colors of the browser. In fact, many of Google's themes not only alter your toolbar, your bars at the top, it's trying to install this theme now. Again, it's going a little more slowly because we're also trying to stream from this. Streaming is actually kind of resource intensive. And again, for future IT broadcasts, I will probably get another system on which to do um, technical presentation. Would probably be best. Okay, so it's installed. And as you can see, it changed our, um, it changed our toolbar here at the top, our tab bar, all that fun stuff. If we go to our home page, which is empty, there's the background image that comes with that theme. So yeah, pretty cool. So if that's the sort of thing you like, it's there, it's available. All right, one more browser that I want to look at, and this one actually caught me by surprise because while it's still a Microsoft browser, it doesn't perform like one. <laughs> Clearly the reason is because they're not building it off their own WebKit anymore. Um, I speak of Microsoft Edge. Now this newest version of Microsoft Edge, I was actually intrigued by this idea for quite some time because of Microsoft making this move, deciding to go Chromium based. So they're basically using the same WebKit that is used in Google Chrome itself. And again, like with other browsers, the Chrome application itself is not using a whole lot of memory. But with each tab, <laughs> we open for a new web page. That definitely will change. Okay. This is Microsoft Edge now. Microsoft has come back to develop, developing a browser that is cross-platform. I know it's available for Windows and Mac OS. Obviously, it comes with Windows. And is also available for Android, for iOS, 
Um, and I forget. Now I do use this browser currently when something in Safari doesn't work right. See, it's got their official website here for it. And I know Microsoft was pretty excited about this revamp. I'm trying to see where we can download for multiple operating systems here. Let's click that drop down here. Ah, come on. Okay. So it is available for different versions of Windows from 7 on up, iOS and Android. So, so if you're using Linux, you're out of luck here if you planned on using Edge. <laughs> so, And as you can see, I've gotten some use out of the browser. I got some plugins installed here. Things that I typically use, things like Remember, which is my password manager. Um, Tunnel Bear, which is for VPN connection. Which I hadn't logged into on it yet. <laughs> Apparently. Let's have a look at some of its preferences. So you're going to notice that Edge will behave a lot like Chrome. And that's going to be normal now because, again, it's based off the uh, Chromium WebKit, which is what Chrome is based off of. Now, one thing that you'll notice is that along the side here, there seems to be way more options than other browsers. Truthfully, the all the options are going to be pretty much the same. They're just categorized differently. But they basically broke things down a little more and made it all just more accessible with one click there rather than just having a few things and then branching out as you go along. Um, Starting with privacy and security, again, categorize settings. Balance is what most people are going to use. Um, basic gives a little more leeway to stuff. Generally not recommended. Um, strict, again, if you want more strict privacy and security, um, if you work with sensitive information in your browser and things like that, Definitely worth considering. It'll actually show you which websites or which trackers came from and what it's blocked. Which is something I hadn't seen on any browser. Normally, you'd have to have an add-on that gives you that kind of detail. But this one does that. It's actually rather interesting. Exceptions. You can have exceptions listed here that sort of get around these settings. Here's where you clear browsing data, your history, uh, cache, all that fun stuff. Some more privacy options. Uh, send do not track request, which, you know, we saw in all these other browsers, you know, it kind of keeps websites from placing a cookie or whatever that keeps track of things that you look at so they can advertise to you. Okay. Uh, checking if payment methods are saved. Again, this is for merchant sites. This is for like Amazon and such. Um, if you got payments, if you got payments that are saved, uh, it'll pick up on those. Um, certificates. Again, this is going to open uh, system preferences, or this is going to open a keychain on Mac OS. Obviously, that'll behave differently in Windows. Um, feedback, if you want to send it, if you want to send Microsoft feedback based on your browsing activities. In fact, I typically don't have those set. I'm surprised I didn't change those. Um, personalization, again, 
This is for things like, you know, tracking what you do so they can advertise, they can custom tailor advertising to you. You know, whatever. And then some of the services they have that go along with it. So, as you know, Microsoft does have its own technologies for some of its security. Among those being what's called uh, Microsoft Defender Smart Screen. And this is its built-in uh, malware detection for the browser, which is which is kind of cool that they have something like that built in. Um, I don't see a lot of browsers doing that yet, and I would like to see more of that as a matter of fact. That said, I don't think that's going to be a real substitution for um, regular malware and malware blockers and um, virus protection software. So, you know, Microsoft Defender Smart Screen in Edge itself is not going to be, say, a replacement for McAfee or Norton or Sophos or Malwarebytes or any of those. You still want those on your systems to help protect your system. So don't take that as a replacement method. Appearance, again, <coughs> excuse me, again, if the website doesn't have something uh, done by default, some of this stuff will override that. Um, fonts, customizing your fonts here at the bottom. Some of these are features that you'll see on the toolbar. Um, things like your favorites button, which is this star. The collections button. Now, collections is an interesting feature. What collections does is it basically acts as a clipper for the web pages you browse. If you're familiar with using applications such as Pocket or Evernote or anything like that, that's kind of what this is. Um, except it's a little more simple. So it's actually an interesting feature to have built into a browser. And if you're known for keeping bits of web page data uh, stored like that, then you'll probably find that very handy. All right. The Auburn Rose, Darth Logatus, thank you so much for coming to stream tonight. How are you guys? Now, I'm going to hazard a guess something here. So, how are you guys tonight? Now, Alvin Rose, I want to ask you a question here. And I ask this only because you came in at the same time with Darth. Um, were you once Kitsune Rose or... Are you someone different? If you're someone different, I do apologize. I'm just noticing the similarity in the uh, in your Twitch handle, along with you having to come in with Darth at the same time, because I happen to know both those people. And while you're while you're answering that. Um, I'm doing while well working art in Photoshop. All right, you are? Okay, cool. All right. Oh, I guess that. Great. All right. Good. Bootcamp full stack Java developer. Wow, that's an undertaking. Um, strictly Java? Because I, um, I actually took a few online courses myself that are going toward full stack development, but I took courses personally more in... Um, more in MySQL and Python 3. And I'm sort of working my way through HTML5 right now. <laughs> and literally, I'm kind of trudging through that, even though I shouldn't be. It should be pretty simple to get through, but... <laughs> But that's cool. What made you decide to go into um, full stack development? 
And uh, Rose, are you um, are you working on a commission for somewhere right now? Or is this something for your own stream? Startup again. You got startup options here, just like any other browser. Opens a new tab. You can continue where you left off, which is any tab that you had open when you quit, or you can tell it to open specific pages. New tab. So this customizes a little bit what happens when you click on new tab and what shows in it. And it's actually kind of neat. I mean, the options are slightly limited. But it actually gives you a what you see is what you get kind of approach to that. So they do have presets or you can customize. You can tell it to show quick links. You can tell it to show a greeting. You can turn content on or off for like news, for headlines, for, you know, like you can see just popped up down there, different headlines for stuff. Personally, I don't like having that on there, but that's up to you guys. Whatever you'd want to do here. Advanced options, which aren't very advanced. It's basically language and you know whether or not you want tips to show. So so there's limited information there working on getting an AWS certificate. Oh, cool. Oh, there's a lot of AWS certificates too. Oh my goodness. But AWS is pretty fun to work with. It's from my stream. I really don't do commissions. I do my stuff for friends and some of them send me donation on my stream for emotes panel. Oh, that's cool. Right on, right on. Well, I know it's going to look good. You do a very good job graphically with all that stuff. That's really, it's pretty impressive. Site permissions, all that specific stuff and more. This is probably the most concise set of permissions I've seen so far. There just seems to be a little bit more here than in other browsers more than what you'd see in firefox definitely more than safari um even a little bit more than chrome itself so obviously things like cookies and site data um camera microphone and these are defaults by the way it also shows you much like safari it'll show you which websites have permissions uh, to that specific feature, whether they're allowed to or not. And you can also set those per site. There would be something in the, um, and I'll show you that here in a little bit. Motion and light sensors. I don't know why a browser would need that. I guess maybe if you're on a laptop or something, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I've never, I've never seen that. Um, Obviously, notifications, JavaScript, Flash. It has its own built-in ad blocker like most browsers do. Pop-ups. That also. <coughs> Plenty of options here. I mean, there's even permissions on whether or not you want the browser to access USB devices. Because again, some web, some web applications might need a USB device to talk to it. Um, case in point, if you say have Google set up to use a physical uh, USB key <laughs> to do verification, that's where this comes in. Documents how how it handles PDF documents, again, in or out of the browser, whatever, protected content, whether or not you want sites to display 
that kind of content payment handlers which websites do and do not have permission to see what payments you have stored in the browser insecure content and again these are for the bot that I'm running so these aren't public and these are not these I know I typically recommend that you do not allow websites to show you insecure content unless you absolutely positively know the site and you know it's not going to do your system any damage default browser downloads where to save the downloads Now, family safety is kind of an interesting feature. This is where, <coughs> excuse me, on your Microsoft account, you can do things like filters. Um, you can do things like watch activity uh, for other people that are using the browser. This is basically where parental controls kind of come in. I won't get too much into that because, well, I haven't used it. <laughs> I haven't had a need. Um, Languages, you can set preferred languages. And when you do this on, on Edge, and I think Chrome has an option for this somewhere also, um, but if you add a language to this list, it's gonna treat it like a language you natively speak or natively use. So if I were to say put Japanese in here, which I'm learning Japanese, so that actually might behoove me to do this. But if I put Japanese in here, and then I go to a Japanese website, it won't automatically translate it to English for me because it's going to treat this, it's going to treat Japanese as one of my native languages, a language that I know anyway. But if I say go to an Italian website, then I can tell the translate, try and translate that to English for me. Offer translation pages that aren't in the language I read through right there. Okay. And if you don't want Microsoft doing that, there's add-ons you can get, like uh, Google Translate to do that. And I'll talk about add-ons in just a second. Printers. So in Mac OS, this will open up system preferences under printers. I imagine in Windows, this opens up uh, printers control panel. But you'll notice it doesn't have Google Cloud Print here for a Chromium based browser. And I find that interesting because there's a lot of Chromium based browsers that don't have that. It's just a Google thing. And I think Microsoft has a good reason for it. And that has to do with accounts and synchronization. And I'll talk about that here in just a little bit. All right, so under system here using hardware when available and proxy settings so you'll notice here that while it would normally give me the option to open and set proxy settings for my network connection for my internet connection here it's showing something different and it's because i have an add-on here that provides vpn connectivity strictly through the browser and this is what i was talking about how some add-ons will take over certain features of your browser because they have to control those settings in order to use them properly. And this is one of those examples. Basically, if I'm using VPN in the browser itself, that VPN add-on is going to interject and set those connection settings for me in order to function properly as a VPN client. And that's just one example. Here are your reset settings, phone and other devices. So this kind of goes into synchronization, all right? Synchronization in Edge is done through your Microsoft account. So when you sign on using Microsoft.com, and they've tied, they started tying just about everything in with your Microsoft account on a consumer level. So your Windows 10 desktop, you can tie in your local account with your Microsoft account and you'll you'll experience some of the synchronization that's involved here like your bookmarks passwords 
things like that. You can see here in this corner here, I've got synchronization on. I'm logged into my account. And here's where the sync settings come in. And so like any other browser, you could tell it specifically, oh my gosh, my eye is itchy and I apologize. Um, you can tell to synchronize your favorites, that's your bookmarks, obviously. Browser settings, things like how you have your new tab page set up, all that fun stuff. Addressing, you know, addresses, your autofill, passwords, securely synchronize your passwords back and forth, whatever stored in its built in password management. A couple of things they don't have yet, and they're probably going to add these later on, but history and tabs aren't are available yet. Extensions and collections get synchronized as well. And again, caveat, some of these things will not truly synchronize out to all devices. Again, extensions, add-ons, you won't be able to use on the mobile version of, of uh, Edge, whereas your favorites you will. So yeah, and then about Microsoft Edge, this is where it checks for like updates and such. And something that I did notice in using Edge this time around is that it performs really well. It's surprisingly well for a Microsoft browser, but performs at an expectation I would I would hold for a Chromium based browser, if that makes any sense. Now something I do want to point out. You know how in here we were able to set our um we able to set our search engine? I'm trying to see <laughs> I'm trying to remember where that was. There is an area where you can set your own um, default search engine. I've done it before. I'm trying to find where that is again. <laughs> this happens, I forget sometimes. That's what happens when you get older. <laughs> you start to forget stuff. But yeah, let's say you set something other than Bing for your uh, default search engine. Like mine, I did set to DuckDuckGo, so if I'm doing a search. It will default to DuckDuckGo if I do that up there. Okay. But. If we're in a new tab window. one of the built-in new tab windows in the browser, this defaults to Bing. You can't change this from Bing. This will always be Bing. So yeah, kind of a small caveat there. Kind of a small caveat there. But yeah, things seem, seem to work pretty well. Uh, I'm trying to find, there's supposed to be, you know, I was trying to find this earlier and I couldn't seem to find it anywhere. Uh, one thing that it does have, this browser has that I haven't seen on other browsers, 
is a read aloud. If you go into the tools menu, there's going to be a read aloud option where you can turn that on. And then text that you highlight, it'll read to you using voice to text. Kind of nice for accessibility. Obviously, there's going to be uh, private browsing windows also. You can and I'm trying to find this and I can't seem to find there's supposed to be a um... no it's not going to be in here I'm trying to find this and I might actually have to just look it up we might you know let's, let's look that up together Soft Edge Internet Explorer Mode. Okay. Now, I may not have it available because I'm on a Mac, but Microsoft Edge is supposed to have a built in Internet Explorer mode for legacy websites. Or, you know, for websites that um, don't have that aren't up to snuff on using Microsoft Edge yet. There's an article on that here on how to set that. And that might only be available again on Windows. Yeah, this is going to be in PC, so default browser. Yeah, so we saw default browser options, and we didn't have this option here. Um, allow sites to reload in Internet Explorer mode. Okay. And that makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. But it's interesting to me that they have an Internet Explorer mode because now that they're... Now that they've moved to fully replace this, and I read very recently that Microsoft is actually going to stop support on Internet Explorer 11 entirely in 2021. Which is, it's, it's, it's actually pretty big news. It means Internet Explorer is officially no longer going to be a thing. <laughs> unless it's something older that you have to open and from what I read the main reason why they have an Internet Explorer mode here in Edge is for those websites that don't open properly in Edge but only in Internet Explorer and this mainly pertains to like corporate offices who have web applications that only work in Internet Explorer and they haven't updated it so So that is kind of a nice additional feature, and there may be some websites out there that work better in Internet Explorer than they will in Edge. And so that option is there for that also. So that is basically, in the long and short, our four major browsers. So... If you're on Windows, you've got three of those for your options, depending on what it is you want to use. And a lot of it is based off preference. Um, a lot of people prefer to use Firefox, and that's fine. Others like to use Chrome, that's great too. Um, I know Edge, as well as Internet Explorer, has often left bad taste in people's mouths because they often don't perform like they do other browsers. However, this new version of Edge that's based off Chromium really works really well. It works very well. Um, so far as I can tell, Microsoft did a very good job with the Chromium WebKit and sort of making it their own and tying in features that they clearly wanted, like being able, like having people able to log into their Microsoft accounts to sync things, um, having having an actual cross-platform browser. Um, 
that's something that they weren't able to do before because of that exclusivity. Um, like even Apple is limited in having a cross-platform browser in Safari because it's limited to just devices it makes, you know. <clears throat> so I'm actually, I never thought I'd say this, but I'm actually impressed with this Microsoft browser. I'm actually pretty impressed with it. So that's why that's why I wanted to include it because it took me by surprise that it functions so differently. And yet still keeps, and yet it's still in many ways uniquely Microsoft. It's like they finally found after <laughs> after how long they've been trying to find a good balance of find a good balance of functional and workable browser since 1995 I want to say ever since like Internet Explorer like Internet Explorer 4 <laughs> you know where they've got this browser that only works so well and they just kept it limited to their stuff for the longest time and then after so long I think they finally found something that works and it's not even based on their technology it's hilarious but still, I think it was a good move on their part if they expected to stay in the browser game. So, so I would say that Edge is a pretty viable option. And if you're on Mac OS, uh, Safari is a viable option. It all depends on what you want to do. It all depends on how you um, browse, how you want to integrate your browsing experiences with your other devices. Um, Security, a lot of the security across the board is pretty much the same. Uh, some browsers will do things differently. And there's always add-ons you can do to help add to some of that security, like uBlock Origin for ad blocking. Um, I've got Blocker Bear to do that with for, you know, for mine. Um, the uh, DuckDuckGo Essential plugin or uh, extension basically grades the security of a website. So, you know you know, just how secure and safe that website is. And it'll tell you about, you know, whether or not the encryption is connected, if there's anything unknown going on as far as privacy practices go with, you know, what trackers it found, you know, what, um, you know, what's actually keeping track of what it is you're doing on the website, whether or not it's theirs or not. And that's something that's and you know that's something else with um that's something else with uh the new edge you can actually get extensions for this browser and this browser gets its extensions directly from the chrome web store and i gotta try and find that again because the one downside to um the one downside to uh the settings with edge is that they as specific as they are they don't quite put everything there like extensions is going to be under the ellipses menu here in the corner but here's where the extensions are at and so they kind of do a thing similar to opera but you don't need anything additional to install actual chrome plugins so they've got their own site for for edge add-ons and these are ones that they and other third parties have designed specifically for edge that'll work best with edge like amazon did their assistant for it evernote web clipper which is on all the you know every browser these are more specific to to uh, Microsoft Edge. However, if you go to the Chrome Web Store, see a lot of Chromium based browsers have altered their stuff so much to where you actually have to install an additional plugin that they make to use Chrome plugins. 
Not with Edge. You can now add extensions from the web Chrome store. Just click add to Chrome. So we're in Google's Chrome web store right now. And I mean, there it is. We can add to Chrome and it'll add it to our browser seamlessly. That's how I got Remember on there. That's how I got Tunnel Bear on there, you know? So you basically have as much expansion for extensions as you do with Chrome and maybe just a little bit more. Themes, on the other hand, are a different story. I haven't actually tried themes. I don't think themes actually work in Edge, but but hey, he who dares, right? Let's try it. Oh, uh, see, it won't do it. Okay. <laughs> so, no themes. If themes are not important to you, then that's no big deal. But that's it. That's a deeper look into browsers, to the four major browsers in a nutshell. If you like this, we can continue investigating other browsers also. We can learn together, um, you know, what's going on with uh, some lesser known browsers that some people like to use, like Opera, like um, Brave, which brags about its security, which really, that's like their big selling, you know, that's their big marketing point. Um, Vivaldi, which is another Chromium based browser. Um, one of its unique features is you can stack tabs so that when you tap on a tab, it gives you uh, multiple web, you know, multiple websites. It's like tab grouping is really what it is. Um, as well as opening tabs within a single window so that you can do side by side. It's kind of cool. You know, there's all sorts of stuff we can do with that. So, so that's it. That's that's our that, that's our first IT episode, folks. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> Some of that went down the wrong pipe. Okay. <coughs> all right. So for those of you that stuck around, thanks for sticking around. I hope I hope you learned something. Um, I don't know if you have any questions on what we went over. I'll try to answer them as best I can. Um, but I'm basically analyzing these with a little bit of practice and my understanding of the technology as based off what I can keep current on and the 22 years of IT experience that I've had. <laughs> so if you have any questions or if you find an inaccuracy, if I'm wrong on something, you know, let me know, uh, do let me know here and I'll be certainly happy to look that up and address it. And maybe some stuff that we'll be able to find out together, which is really cool. I always like doing stuff like that. All right. So if there are like no questions or anything for me at the stream here at this time, um, but you do think of something later on, I encourage you to reach out to me. You can go to contact.tizen.org, fill out the form, and I will see it and uh, look at it and uh, see if I can answer your question. Um, that said, I can't be a tech support, so... <laughs> We'll probably do some streams where we will do some live Q&A on uh, suggestions on troubleshoot issues and stuff, but um, that's about as far as we'll do that. And that could be, that could be, those could be good streams because then everybody gets to learn something. And that's kind of the goal. 